On behalf of uh, Fritz Ur, I would like to welcome you all to this seminar on China, censorship and freedom of expression. When the idea about the seminar came up a few months back, we were wondering who would like to come. Then the Nobel Peace Prize was announced, and I'm uh, happy to inform you that we are overbooked tonight. Good to see so many of you here. A special welcome to our distinguished guests, Sharon Hong, Executive Director, Human Rights in China, and Greg Walton, expert in information technology, including monitoring and censorship. Greg is also a blogger that you can meet on a daily basis on metalab.asia. Let me just remind you that uh, right after this seminar, there will be a screening of the documentary film Portraits of Loss and the Quest for Justice. It's a 20 minute long documentary. For those of you who haven't read the invitation to this seminar lately, I would just remind you why we are here today. And I read from the invitation. What is the situation like for freedom of expression and information and the protection of privacy in China in the light of international commitments? Which direction is technological development moving in and what impact can it have on Chinese society and on the world at large? Which challenges and opportunities are inherent in the rapid technological development? How do the authorities changing control mechanisms impact the civil society? And which role can the international community play to promote human rights? If some of these questions will be answered tonight, we will, of course, be happy. If all of them will be answered, we will, of course, be thrilled. <laughs> then I would introduce you first and foremost to Greg Walton. And uh, as a true interactive person, Greg will not be offended if you, before he has finished, have any questions for him. But then you have to give me a hint. You will have a microphone and you can just pose a question, whatever, to, to Greg. And Greg, on your blog you wrote yesterday night, Pax Ex Machina, peace out of the machine or peace from the machine. The peace price in the age of intelligent machines and whether we are technology freaks or technology skeptics, what shall we fear or hope for when it comes to the development in China in the age of intelligent machines. Greg? Oh, uh, thank you very much, Winston. It's uh, really quite wonderful to, to be in Oslo, uh, particularly in light of the uh, recent decision by the, the Nobel Institute. Um, as you said, the sort of general theme of my uh, remarks to you this evening will be uh, Paxeg Machina, the Peace Prize in the Age of the Intelligent Machines. This uh, theme came to me really when I was reading back through some of Liu uh, Zobo's writings over the past decade or so, and uh, a few years ago he was uh, writing about the importance of the internet to, to his work as an activist and as an intellectual and indeed as a dissident in China, and he uh, left us with this memorable quote uh, where he said, the internet is God's gift to China. I thought that was... Uh, that was quite interesting because it reveals um, a, a number of contradictions uh, really at the heart of, of China's relationship with, with the internet in the 21st century. Um, also, it, it occurred to me that really uh, over the last decade or so, a number of the, of the uh, Nobel laureates, uh, specifically the Peace laureates, have been uh, awarded prizes uh, not just as individuals, but really as representatives of, of networks. Um, so in the case of Liu Xiaobo, I, I think that many people here would agree that the award is not just to him as an individual, or indeed to him and his wife, but to a wider network of people uh, in China and all around the world struggling for uh, freedom of expression and other human rights um, in China. And I suppose, in, in, a, in a sense, the, uh, the award to Obama last year 
uh, was partly in recognition of the role that social networks played in, in his election. It was an award, I think, to uh, the American electorate in a sense, um, and an award to people like Manuel Castells and uh, Blue State Digital, the people who shaped the, the, uh, the social media aspect of the Obama campaign, which was so, um, so remarkably successful. Um, and of course, this year as well, uh, on the shortlist, was the internet itself. Uh, a group uh, led by uh, Wired magazine and a remarkable communication scholar in Italy uh, put together a, a manifesto, um, an extract of which I'll briefly read to you, um, explaining why they had nominated the internet itself uh, for a Nobel Peace Prize. And, and they wrote, and this is a manifesto that you can of course, sign online if you wish. Uh, we have finally realized that the internet is much more than a network of computers. It is an endless web of people. Men and women from every corner of the world are connecting to one another, thanks to the biggest social interface ever known to humanity. Digital culture has laid the foundations for a new kind of society, and this society is advancing dialogue, debate, and consensus through communication. Because democracy has always flourished where there is openness, acceptance, discussion, and participation, and contact with others has always been the most effective antidote against hatred and conflict. That's why the internet is a tool for peace, and that's why anyone who uses it can sow the seeds of nonviolence, and that's why the next Nobel Peace Prize should go to the net, a Nobel for each and every one of us. And there is, I think, a sense in which this year's choice of Liu Xiaobo, Liu Xiaobo reflects that, um, the spirit of that manifesto. Um, at the same time, of course, the, uh, the internet didn't win the Nobel Peace Prize, and there are reasons for that, of course, as well. As uh, Oyston pointed out, uh, not everyone is uh, a techno-utopian, uh, like the editorial team at Wired Magazine. Um, I myself, in fact, over the I guess over the last decade or so, in terms of my work to do with, particularly to do with China, have tried to inject a sense of um, a sense of realism into some of the discourse, particularly in the United States, but in the West generally, uh, surrounding the potential uh, for the internet to transform authoritarian regimes, uh, partic particularly China. Um, and I've done that really uh, in a number of ways. Um, that. Uh, that is particularly, I, I guess, since uh, a paper I wrote in 2001 entitled China's Golden Shield, where I explored the export of uh, surveillance equipment from uh, Canadian corporation to, to the Chinese state. Um, this is, uh, equipment that was, uh, that was put to use by the police and other state agencies to monitor uh, dissidents and, and other people organizing against the interests of of the state in China. Um, so I guess from, from, from that time on, I've been aware really that the, uh, the breathless uh, enthusiasm for the liberatory potential of, of the internet can really be overdone, overhyped. And, and within the community of people who uh, are exploring ways to transform societies through digital networks, I'm very much considered a, a bit of a skeptic uh, when, when it comes to this, so I'm not really all of the, all that optimistic about about the potential for for uh, for the internet to 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 bring about peace. It's really, uh, of course, from my perspective, a tool uh, which can be used uh, for 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 good or bad. That's not to say that I consider it to be uh, a neutral technology. I, that, that's not that's not something I subscribe to. I think that every technology is born out of a specific social context and of course as in the case with the surveillance equipment that I referred to being exported from Canada it's dropped into a very specific authoritarian context when it's exported to China. So I think out of, out of looking at Golden Shield um, which is the name that the, the Chinese state gave to a project to, to create a nationwide monitoring system not just of the internet but uh, of public space through networking, uh, CCTV, uh, closed circuit television cameras, um, through to credit records, um, uh, landline telephone voice recognition systems and so on, I, I realized that it was important to study uh, not just the positive potential of the internet but also the dark side um, of, of the internet. So 
I guess that some of the more recent work that I've been doing uh, has been exploring China's use of uh, the internet to uh, to wage war. So I've looked at cyber war, or, or more specifically cyber espionage. Uh, in 2008, I began an investigation with my uh, former colleagues at the University of Toronto, um, where I've been gathering um, samples of uh, Trojan horses, or more commonly known as viruses, which had been uh, emanating from China and targeting uh, Tibetan groups, uh, Tibetan activists, um, and also with my friends in Falun Gong, um, and indeed human rights organizations such as Sharon's uh, Human Rights in China, very heavily targeted. Um, it's interesting because in the last few hours I've heard that the Nobel Institute's website was, uh, was hacked, was compromised, and a Trojan was placed on that. And I think that when Telenor uh, tracked back the source, the IP address of, the, uh, of, of, of that Trojan, they found that it was in Taiwan. And what I've seen quite a lot over the years is um, the use of Taiwanese and South Korean uh, command and control services as uh, stepping stones, if you like, for people in, in, on the mainland to, uh, to uh, attack other systems. Um, another aspect of, of the work that I... We, that I've done, which relates to this question, is uh, for a startup called uh, Siphon, a Canadian company uh, based out of Toronto, which makes uh, circumvention software or anti censorship software. Uh, that is, uh, when someone in China or Tibet or Iran wishes to connect to websites which are blocked by the so called Great Firewall, the national filtering system in, in China, they'll connect a service in Toronto and make it seem as if they're surfing from Canada. So a lot of banned content is flowing into China and into Iran and uh, other parts of the world through, through this network and, and others like it. Um, this, uh, this system was, uh, had a particular impact uh, on our team during the uh, Iranian revolution, the so-called Twitter revolution, where I was, uh, along with my colleagues, plugged into Twitter for at least 14 days, more or less, pumping out IP addresses, that is, locations of proxy servers that people could use. So we really experienced, almost in real time, what was going on on the streets of Tehran, and were able to see and talk to people who were using the internet to organize um, the, the demonstrations and to get images of uh, the police brutality out to the rest of the world.